Well, I wonder how you've been spending your time during this lockdown when you've had to stay at home. Uh, perhaps you've done a puzzle as a way of filling time, or perhaps as a way of distracting yourself from what's happening out there. I know for some people the concern about contracting the virus has been quite a worry, and so our locked doors have been a form of protection. I heard of uh, politicians mentioning on the daily briefing uh, that the best protective equipment we could have against this virus was the closed door to our own home. Well, in John chapter 20, verse 19, we find some more closed doors. On the evening of the first Easter Sunday, the disciples were also locked in, with the doors shut as a form of protection for them. Their leader has been crucified and buried, and now the disciples are fearful that the authorities will come for them as well. You know, they're fearful of the threat posed from outside. They lock the doors. Now, undoubtedly, they didn't have jigsaws to occupy themselves. But whether they sat round in silence, thinking, or whether they were trying to, to, to put all the pieces together in their minds, you know, they listened to his teaching. They'd seen him do many signs, and each of those was like a, a puzzle piece coming together to show them who Jesus was. He was the promised Messiah, the Son of God. So what happened? How, how had it all gone so wrong? Well, into that locked room steps the risen, resurrected Jesus. He shows them the scars. It really is him in the flesh. Peace be with you, he says. And as they take in this sight, their fear melts away. And it turns to joy that bubbles up and overflows as they rejoice at Jesus' presence with them. And Jesus, the sent one, is going to send them. But not on their own. They will receive the Holy Spirit to empower them. And they will go out declaring the good news that forgiveness with God is available because Jesus has died for sin and has risen. We're not told what else happened in that room on that day or how long Jesus stayed with them. But instead, John quickly br brings Thomas into the picture. Poor, poor Thomas. I wonder if you've ever felt like you really missed out on the party. Maybe it was a work colleague's leaving do or a friend's birthday. And for whatever reason, you weren't there. Uh, but everybody else was. And what makes it worse is the next day, all that everyone can talk about concerns something that happened at that party, which was sounds so amazing, so impossibly fantastic, that you can't quite believe it. Well, Thomas missed the party, and he couldn't believe what had happened. In verse 25, uh, they tell him they've seen the Lord. But it's just too impossibly wonderful to believe. Thomas declares, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand in his side, I will not believe it. And Thomas refuses to believe based on what he's been told. He wants to believe on the basis of what he sees on his own sight. I wonder if that would have described your approach to Jesus. Perhaps you've heard the stories, maybe you've read some of the Bible. Uh, but unless you yourself receive some kind of genuine, bona fide miracle before your eyes, then you refuse to believe. Well, if that describes you, there are some words that are particularly relevant for you in a moment or two. But first, let's consider what happened to Thomas. Verse 26, a week later. Imagine a whole week of, of waiting, of waiting uh, and hearing about what had happened to, to, to your friends, to Jesus. A week of wondering if this could be possibly be true. And then you're sat together in the same house with the doors still locked. Obviously still fearful. 
but this time with Thomas. And Jesus comes and stands in the room again. Again, Jesus greets them all, peace be with you. But then he turns directly to Thomas. Put your finger here. See my hands. You can feel my side. Stop doubting and believe. As Thomas stands looking Jesus up and down, soaking it all in, all the implications of what has happened come together for him. Uh, Thomas has seen all that Jesus has said and done. Thomas has been utterly devoted to Jesus. But with Jesus' death, it was as though everything just fell apart. None of it made sense anymore. But now, standing before him is the risen Jesus. He has conquered death. It's as though at the final piece of the jigsaw has fallen into place and there's no longer any need to dispute or doubt who he is. Now Thomas sees it so clearly. The resurrection, it confirms that which Thomas didn't dare to believe was possible. And so he utters those famous words in verse 28, My Lord and my God. Faced with the evidence before him, Thomas reaches this conclusion. Jesus isn't only his teacher or his master. Jesus isn't just the Christ. He is God in human flesh, the Son of God who's entered into his creation. And in verse 29, Jesus goes on to say, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. I do realise who Jesus is talking about there. He's talking about you and me. He's speaking about the kind of death that we, the kind of faith that we can have. Uh, we will not see the risen Lord Jesus on this side of his return from heaven. But if we believe without seeing, and we are so blessed. But blind faith isn't quite the right phrase. And that's because of why John is writing all this down. He writes in verse 30 and 31. Jesus performed many signs in the, in the presence of his disciples. Which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe. That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that by believing, you may have life in his name. Though we haven't seen Jesus like Thomas did, we can still reach the same conclusion as him. Throughout his gospel, uh, John has recorded uh, different signs that he saw Jesus perform. Uh, each sign is like a, a piece of a puzzle designed to help our understanding of Jesus become clearer and clearer. Uh, changing water into wine, uh, the first sign. Uh, healing the royal official son. Uh, healing the paralytic at Bethsaida. Feeding the 5,000. Jesus walking on water. Healing the man born blind from birth. And the raising of Lazarus. And now uh, here is the final piece. The risen Lord Jesus uh, completes the, the picture of who he is. Resurrected before Thomas's eyes. All that John recorded for us. All the signs and miracles that Jesus did. All the words he spoke all the testimonies of people like John who did see and believe, it's all recorded for us so that the reality of who Jesus is, uh, the puzzle picture, becomes clearer and clearer. All recorded so that ultimately we may come to the same revelation as Thomas. So that we may say of Jesus, my Lord and my God. He is the Christ, the Son of God, 
John wants to make that so clear to us so that by believing we may have life in his name. Now, what we have here in John's Gospel is enough. We, we don't need more evidence. Those who did see Jesus risen have written it down for those who did not see him. John shares Thomas's story to help us who have not seen to believe. I don't know where you are on your journey of faith in the risen Lord Jesus. Uh, perhaps you find yourself doubting like Thomas. Is this all too good to be true? Well, John would say to you, read on. I've written this all for people like you. As you read, pray that God would help you see Jesus as he truly is, the Messiah, the Son of God so that you also can be among those blessed people who believe yet have not seen. Let's pray for a moment as we consider that. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for uh, Jesus' life, for his death and his resurrection, uh, for that part, final piece in the puzzle that reveals him uh, to be the Son of God, uh, come into this world. Help us who have not seen him to believe these words and place our trust in the Lord Jesus. And we ask this in his name. Amen.